This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. This week's episode is brought to you by the Friends of the Magic Word. This week, we'd like to welcome two new friends of the Magic Word, Mr. Jay Frazier and Michael Collins. Thank you, Jay, very much for making your monthly pledge. And also, thank you, Mike, for your ongoing pledge, and particularly for you being the first one to make an annual pledge. For the rest of you, let me just mention that this is a brand new feature that Patreon.com now offers. If you're interested in making an annual pledge rather than pledging monthly, that you can do that and receive a discount, but still receive all the same great perks at whatever level of membership that you want to join. So please go over to Patreon.com, and there you can check it out. Go to the TheMagicWordPodcast.com, and you can go to Become a Friend of the Magic Word. You'll get some information there about why we could use your support. So again, congratulations, Mike, and thank each of you who are the Friends of the Magic Word for your patronage, and thank each of you who are listening this week and every week for coming in and listening. For the last two weeks, we've been running a contest for an opportunity for two people to win an autographed copy of Master of Deception by John Ivan Palmer. So stay tuned until after the end of this episode, in which we will announce the names of the two people drawn as winners who will be receiving the two autographed copies of this book. Well, last week we had an interesting conversation with not only one, not two, but three different uh, people, and I also encourage people to leave comments. There is a place at the bottom of each of the blogs in which that you can leave comments, and again, as I said, I encourage you, if you enjoy the podcast or you want other people to know about how that you like that, if you could leave a comment or two. And there was one that we just got this last week I thought I would bring to your attention. It says, many thanks for this exposition on prepping on auditioning and performing for FISM. I think it may possibly encourage and stimulate others to participate in this global event, and certainly it will immerse us more deeply in the history of magic and its participants, both past and present. And that comment was left by Bob Fitch. So I was very glad to see that Bob was listening to us and that he liked that particular episode. And many of you know who Bob Fitch is, who, uh, well, you should go back and listen. He actually was the subject of an episode we had some years ago. And if you'll just do a search for Bob Fitch in the MagicWordPodcast.com website there that you'll find him. Highly recommend that. That was a really good one. Anyhow, uh, thank you, Bob, and thank you also for those who participated again last week, and that included Vinnie Grasso, who is a past national president of the Society of American Magicians and also the contest chairman, and Boris Wilde, who is a winner of FISM in a previous year and also currently the head of the jury for the judges, and also for Noel Britton, who is a president of the Magic Circle. And he also gave us some great insight to those who are interested in competing. And it was also after we had finished the recording that Noel had suggested that I might speak to our guest that we have here today, who is a winner of not one, not two, but three different contests that the Magic Circle offers. Edward Hilsom is, again, a three-time or a triple crown winner of the Magic Circle contest, and he also had been touring with some illusionists for a long time and has some really great background and some really interesting stories and also a lot to share when it comes to the contest that he had entered, why he did, and how he prepared for this, and also his goals. And what's interesting is that at 28 years old, he has accomplished so much and has such a bright future ahead of him. So I think you're going to enjoy this week's episode with my guest, Mr. Edward Hilsom, here on The Magic Word. So today I have with me from London, England, someone who is actually a Triple Crown winner. He's someone who's won uh, all three of the awards from The Magic Circle there in London. And we're going to talk about uh, his contest and what's driven him. I think it's going to be fascinating. And I know you guys are going to enjoy my conversation here with my guest, Mr. Edward Hilsom. Hi there, Edward. 
Hi, Scott. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to uh, have you on the uh, podcast uh, episode here today. I was talking with uh, Noel Britton, who is the president of the Magic Circle, and he suggested that I might talk with you, and I don't know why I haven't actually before. One is, I guess, because we haven't been really acquainted or introduced, but through Noel we have, and the reason I would like to have talked with you sometime before is because of the awards that you have won. So you had said just before we got on the air over here that there are three different awards that they, I should say, different competitions that the Magic Circle has. Could you describe those again yes so um there's the stage magician of the year which is obviously for stage magic there's the close-up magician of the year and most recently a brand new competition actually i was the first winner of which is the children's entertainer of the year that's interesting now there's nothing that's necessarily i mean you could be a comedy performer but there's not a comedy category necessarily then within any of those um no, so comedy magicians obviously can enter those competitions, right. but there's not a separate um, competition for comedy magicians, although the Magic Circle do give out a comedy award annually at mm-hmm. their awards right. for the evening. That's kind of what I was thinking then also, that there are so many things I want to unpack as far as uh, working there in England. And you are how old? I'm guessing you're probably, what, 27 or something? Or how old are you? Yeah, I'm 28. 28. Okay, there we go. Now let me guess your weight. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> guess your age and guess your weight and you win the prize. Uh, so, uh, so, so obviously, being a young man, you have been involved in magic for a fairly short time as opposed to an old guy like me. And so how did you get – I kind of hate asking these kinds of questions – but because of your path and where it's taken you so far, how did you get started? Sure, I'll keep it brief. Well, it feels like a long time to me because it's most of my <laughs> life. Sure, of course. Magic, get to relative. Yeah, so I guess like most people, I got the magic set when I was very young. I always remember being fascinated by magic. But I guess the interesting thing for me that put me on a slightly different path was when I was about seven or eight, I guess. Mm-hmm. I remember seeing Lance Burton on TV doing his dove magic and it was only a few seconds it was in one of those 50 greatest magic tricks type shows right i didn't know who he was at the time but that image just really stayed with me and although i was practicing card magic and the those sorts of beginner tricks that you get in the magic sets i knew that's what i wanted to do mm-hmm. so it took a few years of really thinking about it pestering my parents um researching everything i could they what you know we're talking about 12, 13 years ago. So there wasn't actually a lot of information easily accessible back then. Um, and yeah, when I was 15, I think I was 16 when I actually got them, but we set up the Avery and when I was 16, I got my first dubs. And that was really mm-hmm. the the big change, I guess, compared to most magicians that see Lance Burton or get into Magic Young. Yeah. I very early on started with working with doves and working on an act. Now, there are obviously other magicians that you had seen, others who have been on TV, and I imagine that he may have been part of another magic special uh, over there or something. Or I remember Paul Daniels and others, I guess, in the UK who you've seen on TV. But it was something about his demeanor, his style, the fact that he was producing doves. Uh, what was it that actually captured your attention? I always think that's fascinating. I mean, it's not just the person. Is it the act? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what was it? It's really tough to think back to that time because since then I've met him on multiple occasions and I've uh-huh. seen him perform live. But if I was to really try and pin it down at the time, I think it just seemed like real magic to me. There's no other way of putting it. I had mm-hmm. no idea how it worked. I had no idea about method. And to be honest, I didn't really mind. I just loved it. I watched sure. it over and over again. And I, I guess there's no other way of putting it. It just connected with me in a way that no other magic I'd seen at that time had. And I had mm-hmm. seen quite a lot of magic. You know, I guess that special had Copperfield and Penn and Teller, and I'd seen, I think, Darren Brown was around back then. And, you know, I loved all those performers, but there was just something about that classical style mm-hmm. without words or performed to music that connected with me in a way that the other styles didn't. Right. Yeah, that that is interesting uh, because I can 
point to different people that I have seen perform, and they do something that I think that is magic. You know, I mean, I don't have any explanation. I don't know how yeah. this possibly could have been done. Seeing someone uh, perform, John Cornelius had done some things that's like that's just impossible. Or Michael Weber, you know, some people is just uh, it's like I, I I thought I had a good idea about how some magic was done, but this was later in my career. Whenever I saw people, it's still sure. I still love to be fooled and to uh, not know methods or see something that. Uh, sounding and mystical uh, to me. It's interesting also that you thought you'd get like into dubs and everything because that's not something that a lot of people get into. You were talking about cards, and that makes sense because mm-hmm. particularly as a young person that uh, where you have limited income, and so you can afford some cards, mm-hmm. but to have an Avery, like you said, to actually have the dubs and practice with them and then the music and this, everything else, I think that would be something more expensive and uh, it's an interesting course that you took. Yeah, do you know what? There was another element you just mentioned that I think was a big factor is that I'd never seen anyone do dove magic live, mm-hmm. you know. So when I was growing up, I was a member of the Young Magicians Club from the age of 10. I was going to the Magic Circle. So that's a, a society for young magicians between 10 and 18 at the Magic Circle. Mm-hmm. So they meet once a month. So I was going to the Magic Circle from a young age, seeing a lot of magic, but I'd never seen that style of magic live. So I think that perhaps is why it connected with me even more when I saw it. Um, on TV because I just wasn't aware that it was even a thing. Even a thing, yeah, I understand. No, there are not a lot of dove magicians around. I mean, it seems like you can, as far as those who are at the pinnacle of their career, there are just a handful of people that kind of come to mind that would be mm-hmm. contemporaries, basically. I mean, some people have been around, Channing Pollock and others, you know, in the past, and Shimada, but as far as uh, new people, you know, uh, James Demare. And, well, it's interesting, you know, that uh, I was thinking about uh, Johnny Ace Palmer, who also uses... Uh, yeah. They produced Dove going close up even then too. It's interesting that uh, yeah Lance is one of the uh, the few people. So it's just there's a lot to that. Now in keeping the doves, did you, you say you built an Avery in your backyard? Your your dad helped you or something or how did what did you do as far as acquiring the doves? How did you get involved with that? So <laughs> I, I could probably speak for hours just on this. Um, I it was really just researching it. So I found. Uh, an Avery builder, because it's quite a specialized thing, right. you know, with, I, I'm i not the best at making things myself. And I knew <laughs> that if we we're going to have animals, their safety was paramount, obviously. So right. um, who's best at building Avery's? Well, someone that does it for a living. So, yeah, I contacted someone who actually uh, specializes in that. And um, a local builder, yeah, helped with the whole project. So building the foundation, it was a a base, a concrete mm-hmm. base, and I also had a shed to practice in initially. I outgrew mm-hmm. the shed <laughs> eventually, but I set some lights up in the shed, and so that's where I started training the doves to fly and flight train them, and I used to rehearse my act in there every day, and next door was the aviary, and that's where they had, they enjoyed flying, and yeah. Well, as they nice developed, then you said that you were working then in the shed where you were rehearsing, then I assume that eventually you yeah. brought them into the house and started rehearsing inside and i imagine your mom and dad didn't care for that a lot i'm really lucky my family are so supportive That's i mean good. even back then taking over the garden which i pretty much <laughs> did for the age yeah. and then it was it was more as it got into winter it got colder quite damp and mm-hmm. i you know got some more expensive props that i didn't really want to keep in the shed so it just made sense to me and oh yeah my family didn't say no <laughs> And yeah, I, I quickly turned our lounge, our lovely lounge into a confetti area with little singe marks from the matches. <laughs> you can imagine. But, yes, I can. <laughs> uh, they, they, uh, I'm very lucky to have been able to do that. Yep, yep. I used to uh, do dove magic. I had done a little bit of everything, and I had a, an aviary also that I'd built. And then alongside the cage is I had a, a, a place for my rabbit. And uh, so I had the rabbit over there and then the aviary that was next to it in, in the backyard. But uh, our temperature, our climate is uh, a little bit more temperate over here. I know that you have some pretty dreek days, you know, that they're very cold yeah. and, uh, and rainy. And so did you eventually bring them into the house and then leave them there or put them in the shed? So I've got a new aviary now, but the original aviary, I did actually put heating in there in the oh, wow. sheltered area. Uh, and... Um, yeah, made sure it was completely shut off, like covered from the elements. But um, after speaking to some vets, I've got a very good vet locally, and he told me they they fine all year round. The only thing that 
uh, where I am, I need to worry about is the water freezing because the lowest it goes to is minus two, minus three. Mm -hmm. And so the dust themselves are fine in that temperature. It's just obviously if the water freezes, they can't physically get a drink. So that's the only thing that I've had to be aware of. You know, I was obviously worried the first few years when it was so cold, but the doves are absolutely fine. They, because it's, you know, it doesn't suddenly go from 20 degrees. To, I'm right. talking Celsius. It's not like a cold snap. Right. Yeah. Right. It doesn't right. suddenly go from warm to minus. Um, yeah. So they're right. amazing. They, they're they very hardy. And as long as they're looked after, yeah. They're... Do you have still some of the same doves today that you'd had 10 years ago? I do. Yeah. My oldest dove is 13. Okay. Yeah. So right. Have you named it? the beginning, yeah. You named it? They all have names, yeah. That, that dove is named Cadabra. Cadabra, okay. Yeah. What, okay, so tell me, how many doves and what are their names? <laughs> I have 14 doves. I, I won't go through all the names. Wow, but okay. They're, yeah, named after just friends, heroes of mine, and mm-hmm. names that are right. <laughs> yeah. <Sure. laughs> Do they respond to you? They, You know, whenever you call their name or you just, you know them? who they are they don't respond to name no but they do certainly have personalities i'm sure you've experienced mm-hmm. with your doves that they are all different and that's true i've got some doves that are extremely affectionate and some that are just very docile you know they're they're, they're different and yeah that's part of the joy they're my little family that's right yep uh well you know speaking of which that's be uh, on a family that i only wanted so many doves and they kept <laughs> laying all the time and so my wife would go out regularly in the avery and what she would say is just uh do an abortion she'd take the eggs and just throw them against the fence she was it's like i don't want these anymore oh my gosh yeah. anymore so as soon as she saw that they were sitting she'd move them aside and pick up their eggs and dash them <laughs> so we didn't have uh, any more than sure. what we actually needed because we knew they're going to be living for a long time i know that another thing the handling with doves that is living with doves that they can have dove dust which can get in your lungs mm-hmm. and i go back to david oliver here in the u.s over in boston massachusetts area who had to have uh, lung replacement and he had a big article that's been in gene magazine and elsewhere about his uh, issue and i know others who have had uh, some issue with that regardless of how clean that you might keep them that they're still going to be having this dust if you live with them 24 7 so that's why it's good i guess that you have an aviary outside that they're not in your house you're familiar with that yes and i became i heard of that i was warned i think before i heard of david's particular story but that's when it really hit home that Mm -hmm. you know it's wise to keep them outside and i'm lucky i'm in an area where i can but also i don't think i did before but when i became aware that it is such a serious problem every time i'm in there for any length of time i wear a pretty serious mask Uh and i switch from disposable mask to a pretty heavy duty one and it's something that also i was very aware of i've toured a lot around the uk and a little bit in america with the birds and even when i'm in a dressing room for a long time i when we can i always try to have the doves in a separate room to Mm -hmm. the room i'm in for the majority of the time and i think just being aware that that is potentially an issue yeah, helps you prepare for it. Yeah, that's a good point. You touch on another area, and that has to do with the places where you can perform that, which is another thing. You know, where you're doing as a, as a young person, and you can only afford cards, but then you decide to get some doves. It, it's yeah. the venues of where you're going to be able to find to perform. In other words, that, that you can find more places, whether it's going to be a, a corporate cocktail strolling or restaurant or pub or whatever, and doing some close-up stuff. But doves is a stage act with music, uh, typically, and something that requires uh, lighting and everything else so you're kind of limited to the number of shows that you would do i mean you can rehearse all that you want for a month for the one show you're going to do or something if you can't find the right venue have there been or are there a lot of venues in and around the uk you said that you had toured around there plus come to america what kind of places do you perform so it's varied really um there as a young performer when i was getting started certainly I would just say yes to everything because I wanted to of perform course. and I, I, w- I would be I would be taking my doves to places that I just wouldn't consider now. <laughs> like I would do comedy clubs where mm-hmm. oh, really? you know, an evening of comedians and I would be doing my dove acts. Was right? it a serious so it dove act? A nightmare venue. I mean, did you have um, comedy in the uh, in the act? No, it's not. It's certainly not a comedy act. It would be huh. more of a variety. Act I was going to say it's a bit of a, a variety. Deal, yeah. But yeah. It was more when I guess producers saw what I did, especially as a young performer, they wanted it in their shows because it was so different. 
I had never seen it live. And I guess the same with these, you know, bookers. Um, and I would just say yes to everything. And it led to some amazing opportunities. I met wonderful people. Sure. And it was from those shows. And I've got to say from doing competitions that people sort of as- associated me with the Dove Act. And that's how I got on this touring show called Champions of Magic, which you may have seen. Oh, sure. Advertised. Um, so I was in the very first show with them and I toured with them for just over five years before okay. I decided to pursue other avenues. Um, and before that show came along, I was at university and I'd sort of started developing other magic other than the doves because I wanted to perform magic and I didn't have the doves with me. And it just felt like the right time also. Um, I was close to really stopping the dove act because I realized I didn't want to do perform it in venues where I had to get ready in a toilet and, mm-hmm. you know, didn't have a proper dressing room. It wasn't really comfy for me. It wasn't comfy for the doves. You know, I, I'd felt I got to a stage where I was comfy performing. I didn't need to just perform for the experience. So at that time, that's when Champions of Magic came along, which it was just perfect timing because wow. it gave me theaters to perform in, to rehearse in. That's when I started really training them to fly back because until you are working regularly, I think, you know, it's one thing training the doves at home, but it's another thing when you're in a thousand, two thousand seat theater with proper lights. Um, and that's when my act and I think my magic all together went to another level. Well, yeah, I understand. And that yeah, you can rehearse all that you want until you actually get in that theatrical situation that it's going to be completely different than what you're practicing in your shed or, you know, or your home or whatever. I recall when, speaking of Lance Burton again, that he had won back in Nashville back in the 1970s when he was the first person to win the gold medal for the International Brotherhood of Magicians. When they had their band call, when they had the rehearsal in the afternoon before the evening uh, contest, I was talking with uh, someone uh, backstage later, and they were talking about how that he had uh, stayed there and practiced throwing his doves into the spotlight so that way that mm-hmm. they would get used to flying back. And he was there for, I don't know, I want to say like two hours, but I don't know whether that realistic, you know, it's kind of one of those legends. Yeah. It may or may not have been, but for some period of time that he wanted to make sure that the doves were comfortable in the larger theater and were coming back. I, I've worked with Amos Lefkovich uh, mm-hmm. a lot in the past uh, here in Houston, the Magic Island. He used to come and work, and then we got to be good friends. And I've seen him work in so many different venues as well, where, as you know, at the end that he has this coop of doves that is released from where the spotlights are. Incredible. He holds yeah. out his arms and they all land, and it's just, yeah, it's an incredible, incredible act. But he was very cautious, conscientious, and caring for his doves. I remember when we were here at the Magic Island, we'd go out for breakfast, like at 2 in the morning or something, and he would have his doves in my car, and he would go out two or three times from the restaurant to check to make sure that they were okay and the car hadn't been broken into, because that was his living. That's not just... And yeah. in in, to him, as you were talking about, their family. The people mm-hmm. have to recognize if they're going to work with doves, that they're making a huge commitment. It's not like a deck of cards that you can buy another deck you know it is not a human being but it is a living creature that you need to care for and and recognize that they do need care you you, you were smart you mentioned you have a veterinarian to take care of them as well i think you do need to have that just like you have your own medical doctor who takes care of you you have to make sure that you have something that you have your birds taken care of or your rabbit or whatever the animals that you're working with so good on you you had also a great venue to work with in the champions of magic then uh, for a few years then too yeah yeah i think you know i think just to touch on the care i think it's so vital that if you have animals in your act that you know that's the number one priority you know mm-hmm. that you care for them and to me it was just um you know it just felt like the obvious thing that if i was worried about some an issue with a dog that i'd speak to a vet like sure, it, wasn't, it was it wasn't something that really crossed my mind as being unusual until um i met some other magicians with animals that perhaps don't think of their animals like that so i think right. it's just i think it's naturally the way i have been with them but i think being aware that not everyone is like that i think it's just worth mentioning you know that if, if you don't genuinely care for the animals i think it not only does it come across to the audience, it does. I think there, there's, there's no, there's no hiding it. You know, you can't fake that relationship. And uh, you know, people often ask me, um, isn't it outdated working with animals? Or you know, audiences don't want to see it. I, I do disagree because I think when it's performed 
with respect and love for the animals, I think. Mm-hmm audiences enjoy it and i've had many audience members say i don't like animal acts but mm-hmm. you know what you did felt different or words to that effect and, that's nice yeah i'm not naive to the fact that there may be some people in that audience that don't like it but maybe don't come up to me but i think there's there's a big difference between genuinely caring for the animals and pretending <laughs> And pretend you're exactly right. Yeah. That goes back to a to kind of show how old I am that I was uh, uh, before the first time I'd worked at the Magic Castle. And Bill Larson said, I got something from the SPCA, the uh, Society for the Preservation of what is that? Uh, Protection of Animals uh, Rights, uh, Animal Rights Association. Years ago, I used to go by the name, uh, stage name of Great Scott. And he said that someone had written saying to the SPCA that Great Scott was on the Azure Seas cruise ship and uh, one of the passengers had said that Great Scott was mishandling the doves and want to find out if you are that Great Scott. And I wrote back and I sent a picture and I said, no, you know, here's my promo picture. You know, this is me. We've never been on the Azure Seas, not me. And so anyhow, I ended up working this fine, but I had to, to prove to Bill Larson that it was not me. And I later found out who this person was and also a little bit more detail, apparently, that this passenger had seen the way that the doves had been stuffed into a, a box or a cage and they were dirty. They were in a dirty uh, area. Just it didn't look like they were being cared for properly and what this person was complaining about. So my point is, I think that people do notice whether that you are showing a genuine love for your animals, the way that you handle and treat them and care for them, not only during the show, but also after the show that they can, particularly on a cruise ship where they can see you, you know, on a daily basis to make sure that you are continuing your respect. And that's not just something that you feign while you're on stage that really is you and this person wasn't at the time so anyhow it's kind of a interesting backstory do you ever receive then after a show or did you when you were doing this uh, with the champions of magic when they were coming and saying that they loved the show but anybody was saying it didn't like the way that you were handling or using animals because i know that there i mentioned the spca but also PETA. the People eating tasty animals, or whatever that stands for, that uh, uh, they uh, also are complaining about people uh, using animals like wild tigers and whatever else in magic shows. Has anybody come to you and said, "Oh, you know, you shouldn't be using doves"? No, honestly, I I never did, and I even asked Good. the producer, and he said, "No, there was not one complaint." Um, you know, like I said, I'm not naive to the fact that people might be thinking negatively about it, but I never had anyone. Yeah, in all my years doing this, I've never had anyone say they mm-hmm. didn't like it or yeah. felt like I was mistreating the animals. No, I, I've had a few people just ask, like, inquire, are the, you know, um, because the doves vanish at the end of my act, just saying, are True. they, you know, sort are of, hitting, are they okay? Like, <laughs> but a bit tongue in cheek, you know, yeah. you, you sometimes get that sort of comment, people wanting to meet the doves, but no, I've never... Uh, no, I, I, it's it's quite surprising, really, I guess. But no, I've that's why I was asking, negative. you know, in, in today's yeah. society, you know, about how that some people are very overprotective about, I say, rightly so, you know, protective of uh, animal rights and want to make sure that they're mm-hmm. they're handled properly. And I guess they can probably see the way that you are handling them with such, with such respect that there's no issue nor question nor complaints. That's great. So, have you actually been training or teaching other people about dove magic? Yeah, part of the joy of it is. You know, as I was performing in bigger shows, that more people saw me, and I had some magicians come up to me and ask for advice, and I was always very happy. And there's a couple of young magicians I'm mentoring at the moment, but yeah, and also older magicians, people older than me that are interested. That mm-hmm. because my doves breed, um, quite a few magicians have my doves, and yeah. um, or doves that were bred in my aviary. And, uh, yeah, I, I feel very fortunate to be able to give back to the community and um, I'm always very happy to help. And especially, you know, looking back to when I didn't know much about Dove Magic, it's nice to be able to pass that on, the things I've learned. And, you know, I've been very fortunate to get to know many of my heroes and they've mm-hmm. been extremely generous for their time. So it just feels only right that. I do the same. And I think it's just a great joy in, you know, seeing others grow and it makes you a better performer and person in general, I think. Good good point. Good point. Have you created anything or invented like your own harness or some sort of a dove production or vanish or something? Uh, or 
Have you used just some standard things? I say standard things that I'm sure has got your own twist and everything on that that makes it unique. But have, has there been anything that you feel that you have invented or created that no one else has done before? That's really tough. I think everything in my act, I've sort of put my own touch on. You know, there's some classic effects, but certainly in terms of the methods, um, there's, there's nothing that I've just bought and used. Everything is a combination of methods or I guess a few of my own touches, but I, I don't really think too much about, did I create this or mm -hmm. is this someone else's, you know, as long as it's as magical as possible, that's sort of my goal. So there, there may be a few original things that I do and mm -hmm. the original techniques, but um yeah, the quick answer is I'm not sure. <laughs> well, then how do you go about, you kind of touched on that a minute there, how do you go about creating the act? What is it that you are looking for? You Again, you're looking for mysterious moments or something that's a little bit different. What, I mean, do you, you say you have 14 doves. I mean, you're not going to be <laughs> producing 14 no. doves in the course of an act, I know. Uh, how do you put that together and decide when is the right moment in order to create that surprise? And how do you um, create your act? So to be honest, I the core act was pretty much the same as I was doing when I was 16 so back mm -hmm. in 2007 so if I think back to that I was just inspired by you know I'd watch as much as I can and um, look at sequences I always remember thinking about it theatrically I wanted it to flow so I wanted it to fit with the music but I also wanted it to flow from one effect into another mm -hmm. um, and I was lucky to have mentors that helped me with that side of things that taught me about theatricality i had a director from a very young age a theatrical director who helped me with the movement and that was always important together with the magic um but in terms of creating the surprise i think i just learned from watching mm -hmm. the people that did it best watching you know lance right. burton channing pollock johnny thompson amos um, right. and later marco carver was a huge influence on me um but yeah, to think about it recently, because I haven't really developed that back a lot, I'm happy to say, over the last few years, because I've been focusing on this other side of magic, yes. the patter side, and doing full theatre shows. Um, but the last time I really developed the back was just before the stage competition. Mm -hmm. And that was thinking about it more theatrically to really improve some of the big niggles I've had. Because uh, when you're touring, you know, you think you've got so much time, but actually there's not a lot of time to adapt and change things. So I had a big list of to-dos that I just kept putting off. And then right. the, the stage competition at the Magic Circle I'm talking about, which was 2018, the few months before that, I had just left Champions of Magic. So I took that six months or so to really develop and work on some, what felt like big changes to me, like changing one of the tables, hmm. um, changing some of the moments, making it stronger theatrically and... Um, I guess I wouldn't have known that those things needed to work without kind of quite a few years of experience doing the act, watching it back and really thinking about what can be better here. Right, right. So you developed a completely different act or just made some tweaks to your existing act no, so to com compete? It was it was pretty, you know, I can watch a video of my act from 2007 and mm -hmm. it still had elements, you know, of, Sure. The act, it's still, there's still chunks of magic that are pretty similar. You know, I've refined them, but it was more like I talk about changing a table, which doesn't sound like much, but, you know, every ditch, every still is a little bit different. The movement, mm -hmm. everything in my act is choreographed to the music. So there's actually quite a lot of movement that I've learned over the last 10 years that I had to unlearn and reteach myself, which really took a while. Um, but it was, a fun journey to have and to finally make those things better. Do you change your music also? I would think it would need to be contemporary. For an example, whenever I watch some classic acts from the past, mm -hmm. let's say like Mr. Electric, he'd use the same music from the 70s yeah. all the way through to the 2000s. It never really changed. So it was a classic act because of the classic music that it turned out to be. But do you change your music every year or so? So this was part of the the joy of being involved in a production you know as a as a magician with a solo act it was always pretty much my decisions you know my mentors would help me find some music but my my act pretty much had the same music for the first 10 years and then the producer of the champions of magic show very delicately eventually asked can you consider changing something and you know he was spot on <laughs> it was by that time i picked 
you know, the music I liked when I started, which sure. was, you know, 90s, early 2000s music, and it was a bit out of date. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I changed the most of the music while I was on tour. And then um, I'm actually starting to redo the app now. Um, and I have just, I'm looking at changing all the music over again. So yes, I to answer your question, it is something that I think is very important to keep the music up to date. It is. It seems like that you have a current act, if you have current music as well, as opposed to having yeah. something that's going to be dated, as I was just mentioning earlier. Uh, in, in that case, do you have issues then with uh, ASCAP or trying to pay royalties for music, or do you have music that is written for you? So um, the only issue... So, no, I don't have music written for me. That is something I'm looking at in the near future. But right now, um, and up to date, I've used recorded music. And in live venues, it's it's um, we have PRS, which is sort of just a, a license fee that gets paid mm-hmm. to... Um, the is it paid by the theater or, or is it paid by you or who pays them? It's it's norm it, it it varies so it's either the venue or the production or the booker, you depending you? on mm-hmm. yeah or, or the app depending on the environment um but the only issue is sometimes if you're uploading things online that you know YouTube might reject it if it's contains some copyrighted music or it would put adverts but no I, I've it's something I'm looking at getting music made because that's obviously the best way sure. music written for me but right now i'm still blocking in and working out the feeling of different parts and then the next stage will be because yes. that's what but i've noticed for an example let's say like uh it's running on the in the u.s right now masters of illusion that's uh, mm-hmm. produced by gay blackstone well none of the music is commercial something that they probably have to pay a lot of royalty rights for but there's something they often have music that sounds like something else in other words uh, i'll just use an example let's say like john barry's music from 007 bum ba dum bum 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 ba dum bum you know so you know what that's going to be but if you change that a little bit it still maybe sounds like bum ba dum bum 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 or whatever that it would still have a sure. little bit in the back of your mind but but they would get past the having to pay royalties for that so that's what i'm saying whenever you're going to be having some music is eventually going to be made for yourself that that way that YouTube's not going to bump that off either. I know exactly what you're saying. I've had the same thing. So am I. You're saying, hey, this is copyrighted music, and so you can't monetize this, and then, you know, et cetera. So fine. But uh, you have to uh, recognize that, you know, whenever that you're putting that together. Well, I assume that that is something you spend a lot of time doing, but then you apparently must have been doing a lot of birthday parties to be a children's entertainer and to have won the Children's Entertainer Award. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about the background on that. That's a whole different subject, I assume. To be honest, I've probably done three children's parties in my life. Oh, I, my goodness. I wouldn't consider myself would a children's that. entertainer, but I, I, will, I will explain the story. So okay. uh, I've had two one hour theater shows which i created for the edinburgh festival oh, yeah. fringe festival fringe. um mm-hmm. and uh the first one was in 2015 it was called genie and that was a show where i granted three wishes to members of the audience and that was um a family show mm-hmm. so i children were involved in elements and adults were involved in elements but it wasn't a kid's show and then my second show uh last year was called silver and it was more of an i would say it was more of an adult show but it was still a family friendly show so it certainly wasn't tailored for the children um but children could come and enjoy it with the adults Mm -hmm. and in both of those shows there were routines actually in silver is probably a better example there were there was just one element uh that i performed with a child and it was probably the strongest part of the show i think everyone watching would probably agree with that and the child was only on stage for probably five minutes altogether Mm -hmm. one part towards the beginning and then a little moment at the end and i realized that you know those moments could go together with another element i had in genie and i'd have an act so when i saw the children's entertainer of the year i knew okay i'm not a generic children's entertainer but i know i have material that works for children's audiences Mm -hmm. so um i put those together and 
yeah, that's how that came to be. So I can that's talk more about that if it's of interest of the material, but uh, just to explain that, although I'm not a children's <laughs> entertainer, um, I knew my magic would work in that environment. That's that's interesting. Now, the contest itself, would you have 10, 12, 15 minutes? What was the timeline that you had to compete? Um, it was a maximum of 12 minutes, a hard 12 minutes, I seem to remember. I can't remember if there was a minimum, but it probably was. I think it was 10 to 12. Mm-hmm. Um and the, the, the reason I entered the competition, well, firstly, it was a deadline. I'm a big fan of deadlines to improve mm-hmm. for and to stretch myself for. Um, but also I realized it was not a children's party. It was held at the Magic Circle. It was a theater show. And there were children in attendance, was, I assume. There were children in attendance, but they were sat with their parents. You know, it wasn't a group of 50 oh, children gotcha. on the floor. Hmm. I was on stage, you know, so all those things that would terrify me about a children's party, of, you know, <laughs> keeping the children... <laughs> Of occupied course. and sat down and all those things I knew would not be an issue. I mm-hmm. the curtains would open and I would do my act. So right. that was home to me. I, that feels like second nature, especially at the Magic Circle. So um, yeah, I invited one child up on stage to mm-hmm. do most of the act, but it was a theatre act in my mind, and with magic that works. For family audiences yeah something that you'd already used and so you took a couple of pieces and put that together so you probably just had what a couple of different effects i mean within a 12 month minute period you wouldn't have too many things you could do exactly so um well, i can tell you what i did i did a miser's dream routine um so my shows are quite stories are quite narrative led so actually this it started with me telling the story of how i got into magic and i won't go into that but I had to cut that really down to fit mm-hmm. into the 12 minutes because... So it was different from the, the story show, you just told us about Lance Burton and watching TV. You had a different fabricated story, I assume, that sounded great for stage. <laughs> well, no, but Lance Burton isn't the reason I got into magic. There was, you know, I talk about the first time I remember seeing magic. Okay. okay. was a coin, the feeling of a coin coming out of my ear. So, um, yeah, I... Uh, to go back to Lance Burton, I think that was the sort of, you know what I realized you could do as a magician. Okay, kind of and, a light bulb uh, moment, yeah. Yeah. So um, So you did the Miser's Dream and then what else? Miser's Dream and then um, the ending of my first genie, which is um, a magician's assistant type routine where I put a jacket on the child Yes. and my arms through the jacket and um, it looks like the child's doing the magic. And actually talking right. to Lance Burton, there's a, there's a lovely connection there because as we were coming up with the ending for my first show i knew i wanted a child to become the star of the show and um i wanted the child to really do magic and the audience give them a round of applause and we're thinking what can they do and i kept coming back to lance burton's routine i saw him do with you know that type of routine Mm -hmm. where you put the jacket over the child and he used to do part of his dove act and i remembered it so vividly but i kept thinking well i can't do it it's lance's and my friend my good friend uh, my good friend james friedman who I collaborated a lot with said well why don't you just ask Lance mm-hmm. for permission so sure. I did ask him for permission to do something based on the blocking of his routine and amazingly he granted me his permission so um, he's a great guy yeah yeah lovely guy and um extremely grateful for that yeah so that came direct well my version of that routine where which finished with the child producing a dove mm-hmm. and then there's a lovely callback where um I pass something on to the child and there's a impossible moment of magic with that mm-hmm. and that's the whole act it, and so that's what won you that year for the uh, children so that wasn't the same year that you had won i assume each of these three trophies that you won were in separate years just by the nature of when the competitions are yes so the stage magician of the year was 2018 the children's entertainer was 2019 and then the close-up competition 2020 now, let's move on then to close-up competition. So, obviously, you had an interest in cards for a long time because you were talking about that before you kind of got into doves because you had cards. So, you maintained that interest all along, so you're always kind of fiddling with cards? Do you know, I, I started with cards and coins. Um, yeah, I think it's the natural sort of starting point, isn't it? You start with close-up sure. magic. It's the easiest to get into. There's lots out there. Um, but I don't really perform a lot of card magic, actually. It's... Um, it was it's something I didn't really realize until a reviewer posted it after my show in Edinburgh, saying one of the, in hindsight, one of the more unusual aspects is you might not realize that you've just seen an hour of magic without any cards or mentalism. Hmm. 
mm-hmm. which was, you know, in, you know, I think it wasn't a conscious effort. It's just I've always liked things that are a bit different and to try and do things a bit differently. And Good for you. in both my shows, there was not one card trick in two hours of stage magic, which is wow. quite nice. So uh, the close-up competition actually treated as... Right. I should say my show, the, my last show I did in Edinburgh, Silver, was a very intimate show on purpose. So coming from performing for 2,000 people upwards with the Champions of Magic show, I sort of became a bit disillusioned with that and felt like it became very difficult to connect with that, those audiences. You know, yes. I felt like a lot of polite energy, especially performing with the doves. And, you know, really in relation to some of the other magic, the illusions in the show, quite small scale magic. Um and I just wanted to be able to perform without a video screen. So mm-hmm. my audience in Edinburgh, it was a small 50 seat room and it was probably my most enjoyable time as a magician performing for those audiences. It was strong magic that really connected and the audience were part of. And um, you're lucky to have found a, a good sized venue up there because I know th- how difficult it is with so many thousands of people trying to find a venue and a 50 seat theater sounds like that'd be ideal. So, so it wasn't even a theatre. It was a basement room underneath the, you know, mm-hmm. there's, yeah. no, there's no, there's not really any theatres in the Edinburgh Festival, but um, it was just perfect for my show. It was a tiny three by one meter stage. There was just no disconnect with the audience. I was there in the audience really from the beginning. And um, so I realised, so the pieces I performed in the close-up competition were from that show. So they were really developed as stage pieces, but mm-hmm. I knew they worked with very close audience. If right. that makes sense. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, what I did probably wasn't stereotypically no wouldn't be known by magicians as close up magic. It's but more stand up magic kind of that thing. works in Parlor. in that environment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, well, if you weren't doing cards, then may I ask you within that twelve minute period, what were you doing? And it wasn't cards and mentalism. What did you? I assume coins. Yes. So, um, I I created a coin routine quite a few years ago called Silver, which gave its name to the full show um that i'm really proud of so that's a coin routine performed to music and i bring one person from the audience up on stage to experience it right Mm -hmm. up close um and then there was another piece of magic that i developed for the show um which is really interesting it's um I, i show a photo in a frame I'm trying to dissect this for you without telling you the full, <laughs> the okay. full uh, presentation, but it is basically based on the importance of memories and checking in on our memories. And I show a photo that I had forgotten about that mm-hmm. meant a lot to me. And then I ask everyone in the phone, everyone in the audience to open their phones and flick through their photos and find one they've forgotten they had. Yeah. So everyone finds these forgotten photos, thinks back to these times. And I pick someone, they join me. Um, I do some magic with my photo it restores it rip it gets torn up restored impossibly they then take the empty frame and i say think back to your memory and they open their hands and inside the empty frame is now their photo that they were thinking of wow that was from their phone and yes so it's a really powerful moment and i stripped that back for the close-up competition because i didn't have time to do the full presentation so it became um Actually, I pulled my photo out of my phone. I added that for the closer competition okay. to have a quick bit of magic at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, showed that photo, brought someone up who had a memory in mind, performed silver the coin routine, and then put my photo in their hands. They opened gotcha. their hand, and in their hands, my photo had changed into their photo. To their photo. Lovely. And they get to keep that. Brilliant. So that was the full act. Mm-hmm. And actually, that time limit was just eight minutes, so it was a real challenge to get it into that time. But yes. um, yeah, it was it was a fun journey, and I got that. Well, the natural progression, I would think, having won each of those competitions uh, at such a prestigious level at the Magic Circle, do you have uh, visions for long term of competing and going to the Continental World Championships, taking you ultimately to FISM? Is that something in the back of your mind you're thinking about? Yes. Yeah, so. Um, it wasn't and then talking about those two pieces of magic the silver coin routine and the photo routine you know I I didn't really realize it until after the competition when you know people were asking me about the competitions as you have um, that actually those two pieces are original with me and I'm really proud of them and I'm still developing them 
So I, I do feel like that is certainly an act that is sort of... Um, fism worthy. Not fism level, but yeah, I guess I'm on the way to being a fism. So I did enter this year the fism European Championships, and mm-hmm. unfortunately they've been postponed to next year. Um, but I've also, as I said, I, I like a deadline because I was going anyway. I entered with my Dove Act in the stage competition. For um, the Continental Championships. That's right. Okay, so uh, you're going to be entering in two different uh, categories? Yes, so I am entering the stage and the close-up. Okay. Um, Would that be called micro magic or not? I think that, you know... So under... I, I am... Uh, it's parlor magic under the close-up. Okay. I think that is a... Cat- yeah. I yes. know they have subcategories. Yes, it was a while ago since I did the form, but I, yeah. I felt parlor magic, yeah, is basically as I took it, intimate stage magic, which is what that act is, is best suited for. So that's going to be in 2021 when they have the Continental, uh, the European Championships. Where that's right. Where do you go to compete? Or would it be locally and they kind of, the judges come around and just judge in your area? Or do you all show up at one place, like in Madrid or someplace? Or where, where will it be? No, it's in Spain, yeah. Um, close to Barcelona. Um, hmm. And yeah, that's why... It, you know, it has it's been postponed because it is everyone getting together sure. in one place and traveling mm-hmm. together. So, yeah, I, I was really excited to, you know, I felt like I was I built up some momentum at the beginning of this year. But of course, you know, it's sure. for good reason to be postponed and gives me some more time to prepare, especially with the, the dub. Like, there's quite a few changes that I'm working on. And um, yeah, looking forward to finally getting out and uh, well, good luck. That, that really sounds great. Uh, so what is your long term plan? I mean, uh, being a young gentleman at uh, 28, mm. and you have done a lot of and accomplished so much that people who are twice your age would <laughs> come close to. Uh, what are your five, ten, fifteen, thirty-year plan? I mean, what do you, what do you, where do you see yourself <laughs> you know, like five, ten years from now? What do you want to I have achieved? Yeah, that's really tough. Um, you know, I try not to look too far ahead. Oh, well, you should. I stay positive at doing what I'm doing, but especially yeah. if you like deadlines. <laughs> yeah, I. I really enjoy the magic I'm doing right now. The magic that is in my new show Mm -hmm. uh, that I debuted last year. Um, Yeah, I hope I had some opportunities lined up this year that I hope will, you know, roll over to next year. And I just really want to perform more of that. So long term, I would just love to be able to perform my show. So in any way, shape or form, really, you know, that that show also is was on purpose created to be quite low maintenance, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Like sure, not yeah. be going from the Dove Act, which needed all the tech and right. couldn't really travel with internationally. This new show is very travel friendly and more about the story and the narrative and the performance than the physical props. Well, that's why I was um, wondering if, you know, in the long term, that you were actually looking to have something that you would have as a a steady venue, some place that you would continue to go back to on a regular basis as opposed to touring because you've done touring shows. Uh, and so I don't know, or, or whether it might be on television or to have uh, your own series or something, or perhaps, again, coming to the States and working in Vegas or having something. I just didn't know if there was a long-term plan that you have that that would be ideal. I mean, if you talk about your show called Genie, Making a Wish, you know, uh-huh. <laughs> what your wish might be. I guess the dream would be to have my own venue where I could, perform show and create an experience for audiences Mm -hmm. yeah i I really love performing in america it was a stressful time with i had to borrow birds Uh, i I will not go into that but it was i was wondering whether my doves you'd have to quarantine or couldn't bring your doves in yeah we looked at it and it just you know i was really worried with the risks of you know i've never uh my my doves have never flown as you know they basically go as cargo and um, right yeah i i just wasn't really too keen on that idea and um yeah that was a whole challenge in itself not having my doves and it felt like going back a step because i just trained them to fly it but yeah so I, w- I would love to i'd love to come back to america um and yeah i guess you know i i have toured but i i feel like if i could do something new on tour it would be exciting again you know i, I did enjoy touring um so i would wouldn't say no to you know sure opportunity that came along but i think the dream really would be to have somewhere where i could do my show but even if that was you know 
touring or doing something else, I would I mm-hmm. think I'd be happy as long as I'm performing. Well, that's what I was wondering. Again, let's say that in a perfect world and that you won FISM Grand Prix, let's say, you yeah. know, in your imagination that you had won that, where would you hope to go from there? Well, do you know, I think what winning competitions has taught me is that they don't entitle you to anything, right? That's a good like, point. No, nope, as, as a as a, you know, I feel like I am still a young magician. As a younger magician, I remember thinking, you win a competition and the world's your oyster, you know, you, the world, right. yeah, everything gets delivered to you. But I, I think what's more important is ending up with an act that people want, right? So I've um, become friends with Marco Carver, who won the first place at FISM in 2012. But before that, he was already probably the most in demand bird act in the world, you know, mm-hmm. he's diary was full for the next six years at one time he has his right. choice of venues and he's performing you know the FISM uh, competition was more ticking a box yeah yeah and it was a lovely box to tick but you know I can tell you the trophies are on the top shelf in his living room he doesn't look at them they <laughs> right you know right. it's not important to him and what's important is working and still improving the act yeah. I think if you got to that if I got to that stage one day where I did do well at FISM. I think that's just the sign that I've got an act that's worth that, that mm-hmm. people want to see. You know, so I think that is what, where I would love to end up, is having an act that is busy and I'm performing and sharing right. with people. Well, that's the attitude of a, of a true performer. When I think of people, let's say, who have won Grammys or they have, uh, because they just want to continue with their music and to perform someplace else. It's like, yeah, they, they've got all these nice trophies, uh, but they can put them on the shelf. The same thing with actors that can put their BAFTAs or their Emmys or Academy Award Oscars on the shelf. They want to go continue to entertain and to make movies and maybe to or won Tonys on uh, on stage. It's like, okay, but I, I still want to entertain. And so I like your attitude of saying that's fine, you know, that the trophies, you've got the right attitude. Again, that uh, I, I'm not looking for that to give me something other than, well, I've done that and I can check off that box, but I still want to continue to entertain. So that's uh, great, great attitude. Well, I, I think it came from, you know, when I started my dive, my goal, there was a big competition at the Magic Circle called the Young Magician of the Year. And mm-hmm. you may have heard of it because Johnny Hart was the first winner yep, and made sure. it quite famous. Um, and it was almost a four year journey. You know, that was my goal to win that competition and all the stars aligned. The act was great on the day. And what happened was, is that I didn't win first, second or third. And I was Hmm. absolutely heartbroken. I, you know, it was so much time and effort I'd got into that. And, um, you know, that, that was the first time I'd really felt down, I guess. And, didn't know what to do and um yeah nearly wanted to stop all together and you know it took some time but I had good friends around me that helped me like, understand what was important and where to go from there and you know that was the last time I really took a competition result seriously mm-hmm. I would say that you know I, that enabled me looking back to now take them with a pinch of salt and I think that helps me prepare for competitions um, because knowing that you could lose knowing that the result doesn't matter genuinely you know people have won competitions and had short careers and people have won competitions and done great things you know it does the people have lost competitions and have gone on to great things Correct. the result doesn't matter and the most important it's not under your control right so mm-hmm. it just taught me all i can focus on is do the best act i can mm-hmm. and it sort of takes that weight off your shoulders once you realize that that uh, you know, of course, it's tough to say to think it doesn't matter when you've prepared and invested so much into preparing. But if you can genuinely get to that point, which yeah. I feel I have recently, where actually, you know, I don't mind about the result. I just want to create something, treat it as a deadline and that I can work towards and, you know, create an app that can go somewhere else. It, I think it's made me healthier mentally <laughs> and also, you know, meant that I don't really um parade the awards as you know you might do if right no i understand (laughs) you've answered my unasked question and that was how did you deal with rejection and it sounds like that you did and you recognize it moved on and then have a great attitude as to uh future competitions win or lose that it's not going to devastate you as it did that first time i think it takes time i mean i was very lucky to have a good group you know good family and people around that helped me um, just with the magic and focus on new things. Um, 
but I think ultimately, you know, it's very easy to say, don't take it too seriously. But mm. yeah, I know, you know, if I'd have told myself that all those years ago, I still would have cared just as much. And I sure. think that's part of the, you, know, you have to sort of go through it in a way to realize <laughs> it doesn't matter, you know? So it's one of those funny things. But I think it helps to at least be aware that, <laughs> you know, people forget when you don't win and yeah. you're the only one that really remembers it. Great advice, great advice. Well, Edward, thank you very much for your time here today. You know, uh, the name of my podcast is called The Magic Word, and I always like to close asking my guests, what is it that's your philosophy of life? Basically, what is your magic word? Not necessarily a word, it could be a phrase. You know, what is it you live by? What is your, your mantra? What's important to you? I think generally is uh, just try and be positive, focus on the thing, you know, be grateful for the things that mm-hmm. you have. Um, and I think especially in magic try and be kind you know it's a very small world and True. I've been lucky to have you know heroes of mine that become good friends and mentors and I've always tried to give back where I can and help others help young magicians and you know I think the world has an amazing way of giving back that kindness eventually but it's just a I think it's just the right way to be you know I've right. certainly be kind. Enjoy like, helping yeah. others, and I think, yeah, we will enjoy others helping us, don't we? So <laughs> We do. Well, Edward, thank you again. That does uh, good words to live by then as well. So for the Magic Word Podcast, and from London, England, I thank uh, you very much again for being my guest. That was Edward Hilson, and this is Scotty Out. Thank you again, Edward, for being my guest and for the good conversation and the good advice that you had given. I hope that the listeners will all take this to heart. There's a lot of really great information in there. So thanks again, and I look forward to our next conversation that hopefully we'll get to talk with each other live and in person sometime soon. Before I close out today's podcast, there is one event that's coming up that I think that you would be interested in viewing. This is a live event called Live with Simon Lovell, hosted by Lee Hathaway, coming up on Sunday, September the 6th of 2020. The beginning time will be at 2.30 London time, which is going to be 9.30 Eastern time, 8.30 for Central time. And you can figure it out from there, basically. But this is going to be a live event and talking with Simon Lovell. And if you want to sign up or get more information on that, I would suggest that if you just go to givingmagic.co.uk, then you can find out some information there. You can get signed up to be on the list, so that way they'll send you a link when the time has come. But Simon is someone who that we all love and respect and are hoping for his best recovery. He is someone who has uh, been a guest here on The Magic Word in previous years, but kind of hard to get hold of in the most recent years. And I often will get some emails or text messages or occasionally when I see people live that they will say, uh, hey, what have you heard from Simon or can you get in touch with him? And I I have spoken with him once or twice over the phone, but it's always uh, difficult to try to have a long and meaningful conversation. So I know that this ought to be really great that Lee Hathaway is going to facilitate. He's the one who had actually helped me to speak with Simon uh, over the mobile phone in the past to uh, have the conversations we have had most recently. But this should be fairly and thoroughly complete, and I'm really looking forward to that. And again, if you'll just skip over there to that website at givingmagic.co.uk, it will give you all the info that you need. I'm looking forward to this event, and I'm sure you are too. So I mentioned the first of the podcast that we wanted to give away two autographed copies of Master of Deception, which was the new book written by John Ivan Palmer and was about his father, Jack Pyle. And we had our conversation with him a couple of weeks ago and first started that contest. Well, we had several people, uh, several dozens of people who had entered the contest, but there are only two copies that are going to be awarded and both are autographed copies and direct from the printer. And so those should be going out to the two winners and so the names of the winners are Wayne Taylor and Ted Mashall. Thank you guys very much for entering the contest and I hope that you enjoy reading your autographed copy of Master of Deception. 
Well, we've got a lot of stuff uh, coming up over the next few weeks, and I know that you're going to enjoy the guests that I have. And in order to keep up with who I am having from week to week and who's going to be coming up and also some suggestions from the archives, plus other great things that are going on then right now, I suggest that you subscribe to our weekly pod letter. It is just a little thing that comes into your e-box, your mailbox, your e-box each week, and that pod letter will give you some great information. All you have to do is go to the magicwordpodcast.com, and there you can subscribe. Subscribe to the pod letter, and that's all you need to do. Easy enough. Well, listen, thank you guys again for tuning in each week. And so, until next week, stay well, get booked, and be positive and be grateful for what you have as you give back kindness. This is Scotty out. <laughs>